Got another Sony VHS machine. This one's an SLV701. One of the more modern units. And it does not use the blue gear. It's the chassis that came out after that one. And this one's got a couple of different problems that we're going to try and solve today. See if we can get this machine working. So let's check out what I've got here. Here we have a Sony. This one's an SLV701. This would have been one of the uh, later of the VHS machines. No display on the clock. Power light comes on. But that's about it. I'm told this one has a bad picture. We'll see whether it plays anything. And it does have a bad picture. Let's see how color bar tape looks on it. So I got the color bar tape in now. Let's see how bad the the, the bars play. Yeah, yeah. This is this one's got a problem. As you can see, even after it's been playing for a while, the tracking never locks in properly. See all that noise? This is one of the, the later of the Sony models. Uh, see if I can find a year on this thing when this thing was made. This was made after. I don't remember seeing too many of these. This one hit the market August 2003, about a month after I left the business. Although there were other ones that used a similar chassis, but I didn't see very many of these ones. They were still relatively new. But it was, it was, it was actually still made in Japan. This is after the Blue Gear era, when Sony moved away from that mechanism. It doesn't have the P6, it doesn't have the... the uh, capstan or pinch roller that that drops down this is more of a return to the original design of the VHS layout and more true to how the original M loading system worked unfortunately these units here have bad power supplies on them certainly I haven't worked on a lot of these because these ones were getting near the end of of the run and it was a lot of these ones here were made after I actually got out of the business if I load the tape on this you'll see that the threading on this is very much like the original VHS. In fact, it's exactly like the original VHS. One of the reasons they changed the design to put the, the uh, capstan back here and have that extra guide that pulled the tape out so the tape went around the heads and then it came over this way and then came back. Well, one of the reasons they did that was to reduce the angle on the tape so that the tape could be fast forward and rewound well in place. But as you can see, this one does it without unloading the tape at the steep angles. Oh, rewind doesn't work. Fast forward works. As you can see, I'm pushing the stop and rewind doesn't work. Oh, that, now it's gonna work. You know what, we got, we got a couple faults on this thing. The, uh, this is a rotary encoder switch on the front here, see? Now it's not working. Oh, that time it did. Yeah, that time it did too. But uh, that encoder switch on the front needs to be cleaned up. My big concern on this is the power supply. And the reason I say that is because the display is out on the front, which means that one of the voltages is missing. And on these units, they were notorious 
for leaky capacitors, and I don't just mean electrically leaky, I mean the electrolyte leaks and gets on the board. So the first thing I want to do on this is pull that power supply and examine the power supply. And these ones are not nice. These are not nice power supplies to work on. You guys will figure this out as soon as I pull it out of the chassis. You're going to be saying, oh my god, Sony, what did you do? If you remember Sony's power supplies from previous VCRs, they are always relatively easy to work on. Undo a couple plugs, pop the top cover off, pop the bottom cover off, right? Easy peasy. Not so on this one. Ugh. See this? Corrosion. We have leaking capacitors in here for sure. Oh yes, yum. Mmm. Capacitor puke. Yum. Oh yes, this one here, look at down here. We have leaky caps. But as I was saying, no nice easy top to remove. Oh no, not on this one. This one was designed so that uh, when it broke, you weren't gonna fix it, unless you're prepared to spend money. On this one, I actually have to unsolder these tabs down here so that I can pry this thing open and get the board out so I can get at the caps and change it. Hmm, let's do it. So first I gotta remove the solder from these tabs. Like that. Just melt it and bend the tab back. P.U. What a stink. I might as well acknowledge that the power supply was made by Mitsumi because if I don't say it, somebody's going to tell me. Like they think I'm blind or something. The extent that we could remove this power supply to. I bet it's only one or two caps that have blown up on this thing. Uh, this is a high voltage capacitor down here that would normally store up at 150 volts. It should be, it should have discharged to zero by now, but we'll just verify that the primary charge is gone, which it is, zero. I let it sit for a couple minutes since I took it out of the unit. So uh, typically these would have a discharge a resistor across them to discharge them completely, or just the just the power discharging or dissipating through the uh, the power supply will run them down to to very low or, or zero volts. But in this case, there's there are resistors here between the positive here side. Uh, there are resistors that will bleed just through the circuit will bleed that voltage off. I'm going to uh, check a few of these caps down here. We'll check the ESR on a couple of them and uh, replace the ones that need to be replaced. And hopefully that will restore the picture and make the display work on this unit again. heard some news now that uh, a couple of other people I know just tested positive for COVID. A couple of people that don't believe in wearing masks and don't believe in not getting together and um, they're young, right? They're they're in their I think 19 or 20, but they're young people. So uh, yeah, just heard, again, heard some more. It's like these people, you know, they're going to uh, suffer the effects of it and go through the whole process if they hopefully they will recover from it but um 
Yep, it's, uh, I say two more people I know. Well, I know one of them and the other one is their friend. So I'm just going to measure a couple of these in circuit. 207. Yes, I think that's probably bad. I don't th think we typically see ESR go anywhere near that high. That one there might be okay. That one there looks like it's definitely bad. ESR of 19. Let's see, uh, 205. Yeah, that one's going to be bad for sure. Let's pull some of these ones out. We'll pull 205 out, which is this one right there. It's a 10 microfarad. It's probably one of the could be one of the ones that is leaking. What do you think? You think that one's bad? Just a little bit high, as in completely open. That's one. Might as well write down what these values are while I'm here and I'll pull a few of them out at once. I think it's probably gonna be just these three here. Uh, C205. Uh, 206. That one's coming up at 1.6. That's a 1,000 microfarad, I believe, or is it 100? That one's a 100 at 50, and the other one is a 1,000 at 6.3. So this one here that's a 1,000 at 6.3 is a 5.3. Well, you know, a 1,000 should be like 0.12, the 0 0.12. And the other one's 100 microfarads. And uh, it's also, you know, I think a little bit on the high side. So we're going to do these three. I think probably I'm only going to change out three of them because I think that's the only three that are that are really uh, causing the problems on this unit is these three down here in where all the leakage was. And this will probably fix the pitcher problem too, because I think that problem with the pitcher was due to a lot of ripple that was uh, that was on the power rail. That one's 100 at 50. C206 and the other one was a thousand at I think it was six and that was C207 if I'm not mistaken we'll check this one again but here's the here's the 100 microfarad at uh, at 50 volts 100 at 50 should be you know between uh, 0.32 and 0.3 0.6 so that one's also going to be bad and then I'll move this last one and I'm going to try and do it with just these three because I think this is the only three I don't see any corrosion around these ones here but I do see some corrosion around these other ones which were obviously taking a leak on the board oh nice foil lifted up there Oh yeah, this one stinks. This is the one that was this is the one that was spilling its guts. And of course, this one's measuring 3.1. But you gotta remember this is a thousand microfarad. A thousand microfarad should be like point should be less than uh, point one two because that's for a 10 volt and this is a 6.3. So 
So um, those are the three I'm going to change, and then we'll try this thing. Just going to clean up the board here with some solder wick, and clean up the holes so that I can install the new parts. I'm going to do that by applying some fresh solder. Solder with an L. Because I say it the right way, I don't speak like an American. If I said it the other way, I'd get all the uh, the language snoobs giving me a bad time telling me I'm not pronouncing it the right way using the Queen's English. So just going to clean up the board here a bit. Go find some new parts. If you want, I'll test the other caps, but I think the other ones are okay. We'll take a look at them anyway, just for the hell of it. What size is that one? That one might be going up a bit, but... Uh, Is this thing 10 volts? So, uh, between a 0.12 and a 0.23, this one's a little bit high. I'm not going to change this one, it's 0.7. I'm not going to change it though. It's a big cap, I don't have one. It's 2200 microfarad, I don't have one, and it's not going to be the one that's causing the problems anyway. It would have been the other ones that were that were open. back in place. It actually sits into these little, little tabs down here, little holes. The tabs fit into the holes to hold it in place. I'd say it was a 
it was a design that was done in such a way that uh, people wouldn't want to repair them. These were sold as an entire block. When you had something fail, Sony didn't want you fixing them. They wanted you to buy a new one. That was the whole idea behind this design. Was it when it broke down, you bought a whole power block at half the price of the VCR? So we'll get the power supply back in this one and then I will deal with the the encoder switch at the front. You can see that they started to go back to sub-assemblies on this. I hated these composite boards like this. That one's probably, what is it, chroma? It's probably the chroma. There's a crystal on there. So it's probably the chroma chip. But I started to hate this design because, um, I mean, yeah, you could you could pull this little board out and change some of these capacitors of it if need be, but um, um, they weren't as bad as Panasonic with their on glass design but still uh, these these circuits here I didn't like them still not looking great Is there sound on here yeah the sound is there this thing's still not looking great Noise reduction off and on. Noise reduction off, noise reduction on. Uh, it just makes the picture softer. See, look at the detail. Yeah, that's noise reduction. We'll just reduce the sharpness. I'm just going to clean the guides as, as it's turning. Every time one of these guides turns around, I hear the pitch change. Looks like there's a bit of debris on, on one of them. So I'm just going to give the P2 and P3 guide bit of a scrub. <whistles> Pinch roller, are the capstans actually filthy? You can probably see on that.
take a look at the caps and shaft. Yeah, it's pretty bad, huh? I've seen all that dirt off there. That might be impacting the picture a bit by causing the tape speed, uh, the tape speed to shift slightly as it's every time it makes a rotation. As you can see, a fair bit of dirt on this thing. I'll go around the lower drum with the Q-tip, but not near anywhere near the heads. I think my alignment may be a bit out on this machine, so let's hook up the scope and uh, take a look at the tape path alignment. On this unit, we trigger to the second pin over from the left, and our RF is on the third pin over, right here. I'm using a jumper just because the, uh, the clip for my other probe is broken. The hook is broken off it, i got to get a new probe. If you look at here, you'll see... The little hook there snapped off. So I'm just using a jumper wire. We'll look at the uh, output on the scope and uh, we'll try and get the alignment right on on this one. It's a little bit off. So what we're looking at here is we're, actually, we're looking at both signals. We're looking at the head switching point which is on channel 2 and we're looking at the head. So that just gives you an idea what the switching point looks like. Yeah, that's the reason it's looking like it's looking now is that I've got uh, my RF generator is on here. We flip that off, that line will clean up. Just have my little AM test transmitter running. So what I want to do is I want to uh, adjust my entry side guide, which is the left side of the uh, head, and bring the level flat. I don't need to have the superimposed image on. I can turn it off. And I'm just going to adjust it and bring that flat. Picture's looking pretty good now. In fact, that's looking excellent. Let's see if that encoder switch is still acting up when I hit the rewind. Forward. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's, uh, I'm just going to. Uh, We'll, we'll clean up that encoder switch. So I'm going to remove the front cover. Just release the plastic catches on either side and the front cover will pop open. The switch actually is supposed to stay attached to the circuit board, but because I didn't remove the button from the front of it, it actually pulled off from the front, but that's okay. It's easy enough to pop it back on the board when we're done. Okay, the switch just pops apart like that. And it's an encoder switch. I don't know if I can get this thing apart or not. It should come apart. If I bend some tabs, it should...
I might be opening a real can of worms here. Oh yeah, look at that. Kind of looks like a kind of looks like a mode switch, doesn't it? I'm almost tempted to clean the mode switch on this thing just because I know it's going to look as bad as that. I'll use some Deox at D100. And I'll just put some on the switch contacts and kind of scrape them a bit and we'll wipe it down with a cotton swab in a minute here. looking a little bit better. Actually it's looking a whole lot better. We'll put some deoxid on the contacts here as well and then put the switch back together. Switch, to, switch goes together like this with the springs on either side. That's how you know it's together the right way. It was going to the left that was causing me the trouble, which are these contacts up top here. So we'll just make sure that these ones are, are clean. switch plugs in like that and then the front cover I should have pulled the button off it before pulling the front cover off that's why the whole uh, the switch popped out the front cover then goes on like this display is lit up by the way it's just not very bright I can see it fine if I cover it up with the lights on in here it's uh, pretty bright okay fast forward rewind and it's playing and looking great Pause works too. 
pause, playback. So that's that. I've got this one uh, going. Got the power supply repaired on this one. Got the display lighting up. Again, it's it's hard to see on camera, but it is lighting up. It's on channel one right now. And if I switch it here, channel two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's lighting up. The fluorescent display does light up. It's, I say it's tough to see in all the lights here. I don't know whether we can get at the uh, the mode switch on from the bottom on this one or not. I guess I could, uh, I could take the bottom off it and see whether we can get at the mode switch on this one. Pop the bottom off it and take a look. Well, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna let sleeping dogs lie. Sorry, I don't need the headaches and aggravation of taking this piece of crap apart. It's got uh, three belts down here. One that operates the, well, it does everything. It, it uh, operates the take up and supply reels. Through this clutch, it operates the loading for the front loading mechanism. And then this belt here, they all seem to be relatively tight. Uh, this one here is the actual loading motor that spins this one which moves the cams back and forth as you can see now this one forget it if it's not acting up I'm not too worried about it there's only so much I'm willing to do on this machine and I've done all that I'm willing to do after all this is my machine this one was given to me at the same time the guy gave me that TAC cassette deck that I was that I used to pull the motor out of to fix that techniques he gave me that TAC cassette deck and the Sony VCR so I'm gonna turn around and sell this one and um, cleaning that mode switch isn't gonna get me any more money for it but fixing the power supply I had to do and do the tape alignment I had to do that because it wasn't working but now it do now it does work and it's got a good picture so I can I can make my thirty or forty dollars or whatever I'm going to get for this thing. I won't get a heck of a lot for it, but uh, I can get something for it. I'm sure. There's the unit back together playing color bars. Color bars look good. I'm not even going to bother testing this for record because in reality nobody's ever going to record. If it plays, it's going to record anyway. We know that. But uh, in reality, anybody who ends up with one of these things that I sell, they're not buying it to record they're buying it for one reason only to play back tapes that they've already got and their existing machine is shot so that's the only reason people buy use VCRs as they want them to play back their tapes if it plays back it's good and this one's playing back so that's it thanks for watching we'll catch you in the next one bye for now